Okay, so um, do a, another reading this evening, second night of our uh, retreat, winter retreat. Do another reading from Ajahn Suchita's Breathing Like a Buddha. Uh, uh, started that last night. Um, and just a little, you know, a little uh, prelude or preamble uh, to all of this is that uh, I was just reading an article about um, the attention span. The, the normal attention span these days is growing much and much, much shorter over the past 15, 20 years. And uh, it's now like on a web page, I think it's something like down to 45 seconds a page um, before people scroll through and, and uh, switch uh, to something else. And um, part of our training, of course, is to develop uh, the ability to control our attention and uh, do so uh, appropriately by helping to kind of slow down the input uh, in, our, in our lives. So kind of uh, pertinent to that, um, Ajahn Suchito is somebody who takes a lot of attention to, <laughs> to, to listen to when, when um, he's, his teachings are being read. He's very, uh, sometimes uh, uh, people find him a bit complex uh, and uh, a little bit hard to follow. And I think that might be true for me, especially if I hear it being read. Um, and, and I'm one of those, you know, my attention span sometimes kind of wanders as, as well. But uh, um, it's very, you know, just like, like you know, Coffee is described these days as very rich, full-bodied, um, complex with many overtones of different kinds of things. So if you really listen um, or read Ajahn Suchito carefully, there's a whole lot in here um, that I think can be very useful because he's got a way of really, to me, uh, weaving uh, teachings strictly straight from, from the suttas. You know, he's very sutta-based. Uh, with his theoretical teachings, if you will, um, but also um, very, very much uh, oriented towards applying it uh, to his, you know, experiences, practices, reflections, and the way he trains his mind and encourages us to do so. So as complex as it is, it can be useful, a really useful roadmap. And if you find yourself getting a bit distracted or hard to follow while I'm reading. Just you know, keep trying to raise up that energy, uh, what the, the Buddha talks about, listening with eager ears. So you have to kind of raise your energy, don't slump your posture, and you're making a, de a determination to kind of follow along as best you can. And if it's not clear in certain points, um, uh, just know that you can always go back to the book and read it. I find reading, reading his books uh, kind of like a, um, you know, kind of a savoring just a, a page or two at a time at the most, uh, and then really reflecting on it is a very useful uh, way to, to receive his teachings. So that's a bunch of disclaimers here uh, coming up for the next bit. Um, one of the things, if you've done any reading uh, of his or, or listened to his teachings or attended retreats uh, from him, is that he talks a lot about uh, sankhara, uh, which um, we'll get into here a bit, which can be a bit of a heady uh, topic, but it's so interwoven into the teachings, uh, and we'll be seeing more of that coming up uh, over the next three months, uh, references to the word sankhara, and uh, it's, a, it's a very, um, well, it, it's got different nuances in different contexts. So um, it means many different things at many different times and many people, many different people kind of interpret it differently and, and uh, use different words. So um, what you're getting here is uh, Ajahn Suchito's uh, take on Sankara, or part of it anyway, uh, and um, the reason I'm choosing this particular section is because then he really does pull it into the realm of experience, what it is that we're uh, engaging in in our, in our meditation in our minds uh, as we look at the flow of mental activity and how to skillfully use the concepts, and these are concepts to start with, uh, how to use it to really pull uh, 
uh, the Dhamma inwards and, and uh, understand our own experience more clearly. So um, I'll just go ahead and start um, with uh, all of those uh, preliminary comments. <clears throat> This is starting on page 120 in the book. Uh, Formative energies and the contracted state. As an overview of the process that I've detailed in the last few chapters, I'd like to explore what is referred to as formation, sankara, plural is sankara, with a long A at the end. Formation is a common, though not very accessible, translation. But the number of ways of translating sankhara indicates the difficulty of finding a single word or compound to cover all its meaning and applications. Sankhara is also rendered as volitional formation, comma formation, fabrication, condition, determination, preparation, activity, conditioning force, and synergy. Without wishing to further complicate the matter, I'd suggest formative energy, or program, can also help to make its meaning clear. In terms of experience, sankhara are the the reflexes and responses, for example, of forcefulness, agitation, or enthusiasm, that steer us. Moreover, these formative energies shape us. You can witness these in terms of body language. When people get angry or fearful, visible and palpable changes occur. Depending on how it's triggered, kaya sankara, the bodily formation, can activate bodily reflexes of tension or relaxation, defense or welcome, and so on. And in tandem with that, chitta sankara, the mental or heart formation, sends emotions and impulses rippling through the body, So the heart gets shaped as light or compressed, expansive or tight. Finally, based upon these energies and shapes, the mind gets activated and fabricates trains of thought, the formation or program called vachi sankara. That manas program, manas, M-A-N-A-S, generally translated also as mind, but very different from chitta, when it's translated, also translated as mind. Um, Ajahn Jeff uses the word intellect, so it refers to those cognitive, abstracting uh, kinds of conceptual processes. That manas program produces thought streams that may be clear and direct, or muddy and meandering, and shape a course of action. Sankara, once you unwrap the word, you see how crucial and intimate intimate they are. To summarize, these three sankara are energetic programs that underpin and connect body, heart, and thinking. They get things going, and the way sankara move in the bodily and mental domains lays down results and establishes patterns for further action, for one's welfare or harm. Sankara are the basis of cause and effect. This is why understanding them is so central. To grasp the full significance of Sankara, it should be borne in mind that these formative energies co-activate bodily and mental experiences. A bodily Sankara will form a corresponding emotional form and vice versa. To take a simple example, Discordant sankhara are experienced as bodily tension or somatic blocks that link to emotional reactivity, psychological imbalance, and compulsive, afflictive thinking. In this state, they establish what in classical parlance is referred to as clinging to the aggregates, kanda, and which I'll call the contracted state. This is the norm wherein the chitta is experienced as an isolated self, stuck inside a body, separated from and yet surrounded by a world. In this condition, the thinking process tries to establish the future, work on an identity, and speculates and obsesses over the details of that virtual reality. 
All that can be summarized as sankhara affected by ignorance. This scenario becomes apparent in meditation, which is why I'm reading this, because we're talking about the first few days here of meditation. This scenario becomes apparent in meditation when there is no apparent reason to feel tense or depressed or to plan the future. What is occurring is that a mental formation, citta sankhara, is producing these moods, impulses, and attitudes. These may be familiar, and they are all convincing. Intense dramas of the wrongs others have done to you, or the wrongs you have done to others, will arise. Either that, or colorful fantasies of what you could be doing now, rather than just sitting here. Consequently, there's a lot of thinking. That is, the verbal formation picks up the emotional theme. What the average person doesn't really give attention to is the effect on their bodies and how this amalgam of heart, thought, and body shapes the contracted world view. And yet, acting on this, one generates consequent scenarios. And to quote from the suttas and Gutra 3, some person generates hurtful bodily sankhara, hurtful verbal sankhara, and hurtful mental sankhara. In consequence, they arise in a hurtful context. When they arise in a hurtful context, they receive hurtful contact. Being touched by hurtful contact, they feel feelings that are hurtful and miserable. The kind of scenario that this outlines is one where, wherein one's own contracted state gives rise to a sense of isolation and configures an alienated world through focusing on details that will confirm that view. Then, from that basis, there arise emotional proliferations about one's inadequacies or that of others, along with the need to go somewhere else or be someone else. These patterns can become established with traumatic intensity. Moreover, personal strategies and attitudes, far from being able to unravel the sankhara, often get generated as a response to deflect attention from their underlying presence. We fidget, distract, nibble, switch on a device, and so on. This gets compulsive. Someone who seeks their own welfare therefore has to proceed in the face of distorted sankhara, guided by the direct experience that this is stressful, constricted, is good for neither myself nor others, and it can be changed. Handling reflexes. Yes, sankhara can be managed to bring around harmony and release. This is the thrust of the sequence of meditation teachings we're exploring, whereby bodily, mental, and verbal sankhara are cleared of obstructions. The result is bodily refreshment, ease, and quiet lucidity. Even more profound, the insightful understanding of them opens the citta to the realization of the asankata, the unconditioned release of the heart. For an undeveloped mind, the roots of sankhara are involuntarily, involuntary and inaccessible. One finds oneself caught in or overwhelmed by a sudden surge or constriction in the body and heart. So it takes a practice such as anapanasati, which covers the energies of body, heart, and thinking, to penetrate that involuntary reflex, then to steady, soothe, and release it. Just sensing the true ground of the body in an unobstructive space, with breathing rhythmically flowing through it, offers a cleansing. As a result of this clearance are a bright and easeful heart. This alone makes Anapanasati a powerful resource for liberation. Understanding that Sankara are conditioned energies rather than aspects of a true self is another important theme. In fact, although they build me, or my psychological shape anyway, and my world, these formative energies don't even depend on what I've done. Sankara are also acquired through the actions of, or influence of others. In other words, your mindset is not fundamentally your own. It has been conditioned by the parental and social contexts within which you grew up, with their perspectives, imperatives, and aims. Your bodily energies and impulses, open, relaxed, 
defensive, jittery, are similarly conditioned. You've been programmed by the modes and language of your nation and family. And that involves taboos, prejudices, and the aims of the mainstream, including striving for goals that you can't achieve and an identity you can't have. At best, the conditioning forces of the so social world bind you into being a person subject to loss and gain, competition and comparison, the need to get on, and anxiety about failure and social rejection. The impulsive and creative aspects of these formations, their potency and ability to steer behavior for good or bad, are taken to be an agent known as I. Thus, these sankara form a comic footprint or blueprint, myself. They shape a self-impression and establish a behavioral basis day after day. We keep becoming, embellishing, and confirming these sankara patterns laid down in the past. Yet, as one begins to recognize, although it seems like I'm doing the worrying, doubting, or craving, I can't seem to stop it. Granted, one might be able to suppress the sankara for a while. So what kind of an agent am I when I can't establish decisive agency over my mind? Now we might start to call ourselves names, such as worrier, compulsive, or avoid the issue altogether. But none of these check the stress that our minds inflict on ourselves and others, nor do they allow our considerable potential as wise and great-hearted beings to actualize. The Dhamma strategy, then, is to meet these sankhara and steady and cool them, and through that gain, and through that gain access to the asankata, the unconditioned unbinding, nibbana, releasing blockage. In order to release the knot where sankhara form the contracted state, you use skillful sankhara. These helpful formations include the kind of thinking and heart energies and attitudes that flow along with healthy breath energy. In a nutshell, be guided by your breathing rather than yourself. As a practical tip, this means that you don't aim for the center of the problem and you don't try to fix it. Instead, you turn your attention to the overall embodied spirit presence and let that steady your awareness. From that basis, you access a source of steady and soothing energy, in this case, that of in and out breathing. Then the practice is to keep connecting the difficult area to the healthy mix of verbal, heart, and embodied energies that you have established as a foundation. This can then flow into and work on the difficult pieces in its own time and way. Herein, the golden rule is that you don't go into a bodily or psychological area that feels highly activated, troubled, or potent without that steady presence. The motto is, good energy knows what it's doing, so stay with it. As this work and the releasing effect that it has may seem disorienting, how can you be confident that this is the correct approach? The two standards to keep checking in with are, A, is my whole body here? Can I feel my feet and my back? If I can't, am I spinning out or tightening up? Better stand up, flex a little, or walk. This approach can help to facilitate a proper boundary within which energy can settle. In tandem with that point, point B is, can I establish and maintain a quality of goodwill towards this experience? This isn't as straightforward as it may seem, because it requires wise goodwill, not a sentimental coding. Goodwill as a Dhamma practice is informed by the understanding that this energy or condition needs some supportive attention. I'll place my awareness next to it and listen. May this quality of patient and sympathetic attention help it to find its resolution. This may seem to be overcautious, but sankara are both the patterns laid down by reactions such as fear or repression or other forms of stress, as well as the ways 
whereby we manage these reactions. In brief, our emotional outbursts, our skillful and unskillful responses, comma, are sankhara. But rather than suppress or complicate them, the wise approach is to use embodiment and a steady heart to release and resolve these comic formations. Skillful thoughtfulness. The energy and effective use of Vachi Sankara is encouraged. As the thinking mind is the most common form of mind that feels contracted and stressful, meditators will often attempt to silence this thinking process. It's true that a lessening in conceptual activity and intensity is encouraged. The Buddha comments that even skillful thinking, quote, might tire the body, and when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from concentration. And that's from the Majjhima Nikaya, two kinds of thought, I believe. However, when we often fail to make use of its simple and skillful thoughtful, However, what we often fail to make use of is simple and skillful thoughtfulness, the manas activity, intellectual activity of careful, deep attention, yoniso manasikara. In practice, this means to use a word or a reminder to keep lifting attention and placing it on the simple grounding presence of the whole body until the flow of breathing can be sensed. When there is enough stability, the thinking mind can also be employed to investigate and explore the qualities, dhamma, of the contracted state and their release. For this, rather than suppress thinking altogether, we contemplate the tone of the emotion that supports the thought as it arises and takes hold. This is the sign of the mental formation. There's a pressure, a blurring, or a contraction of some sort. One should know it as such, rather, as a, rather than as an objectively true state of affairs. And again, pause, widen attention to include the entire body, and hold that sign within the calming and receptive flow of the breathing. As the hindrances abate, you'll get some understanding of how your heart gets caught, how it forms you and your history, and how you can step out of that. As you feel the sign shift, maintain attention and stay open. And gradually energies and feelings of refreshment and ease will arise. Let them determine how you experience your body and moderate your mind. Working in this area, understanding dawns that any mental form, mind state, or attitude is conditioned and not self and that the true basis is not any of these, but signlessness. When the open, unconditioned balance of mind is directly known, any contracted state is also recognized as needing to be released, rather than allowed to support confused and afflictive mental states. There are further aspects to this Sankara process, but we'll get into that later. So that ends that particular section. Um, I have another section that I'll read too, but just to kind of summarize, um, there's a lot there. <laughs> uh, and again, you know, to take it in slowly, by, if, you, if this seems to speak to you in some way, uh, going back to the book itself and spending some time uh, chewing it over and bringing it in to see how it works in your own heart, your own mind. But um, it's kind of, for me, I think it's uh, quite useful uh, in other readings that I've read of, of uh, Lumpur Sachito. He weaves these three formations, these three kinds of sankhara uh, together in a really useful um, practice paradigm, I think, with, um, uh, as, he, as he talks about, um, uh, you know, we experience all the uh, painfulness of um, patterns and habits and reactivity, just you know, running down the same track He's often described, or he has described uh, sankhara as kind of like a, a, you know, a, train, a train running down a track. Um, and that uh, intention is, is kind of the energy behind it, um, or the, uh, the push behind it. 
uh, run by, fueled by, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion. And so we're just running down this, this track of habitual responses and kind of, you know, living our life out in that way. Um, the just constant reaction to the citta sankara and then... Um, but the skillful um, way to deal with it is to really develop something that is developed, undeveloped from, for most of us, and that's really tuning into the bodily aspects, the bodily formation, uh, the kaya sankara, and really relaxing, developing, you know, smoothing over, uh, refreshing, bringing energy through this bodily formation is a way of receiving all this mental energy, uh, you know, all these memories and thoughts and habits and emotions, these energetic flows. Um, if we can really tune into the bodily flow of energy and use the breathing to help settle and calm it, then um, there's a way for it to drain off and release. And we use the verbal formation, the the words in our head, our thinking, uh, to help support that by using it skillfully, not running away with our thoughts, not getting lost in some sort of thought streams and content, but but, um, using selective words that uh, point us in, in a skillful direction. Um, I like to call it like a Dhamma vocabulary. You have your, your set of uh, single words or small phrases that you use as a thinking process to steer you in a skill, skillful direction. You know, words like, uh, you know, if you're trying to develop loving kindness or an ease in the heart, just coming up with a word that speaks to you personally. Um, and you kind of have to think about it. What, what does loving kindness feel like? You know, what's the actual feeling tone? So for myself, I use the word gentle. So I just pick that up. You pick up a, a word, a vocabulary, just dumb a vocabulary, like gentle, that means something to you personally and that can evoke a really calming, soothing, uh, supportive kind of energy. Um, or peace, that's another one. You know, something to kind of throw in there to help steer the body and the mind uh, to a skillful place of holding uh, all these patterns and energies that kind of constantly flow through our, uh, our, our chitta, our hearts. So that's how you, the, the weave of these three kinds of sankara, the three major kinds of sankara, um, can work together. Okay, well, I think I'll um, leave that there and just go to the last section that I'm going to read, and then we'll have some time for uh, questions or comments if people have any. Um, this last section is towards the end of the book on page 204 it's just a couple of pages um, and uh, he's talking a bit about um, where we'll be moving uh, in, the, in the direction of uh, the fourth Satipatthana um, uh, in another few days week or so um, with just some general comments about mindfulness uh, and uh, some of the topics that we'll be exploring. Um, and that'll be a segue a little bit into tomorrow where I'll, I'll talk a little bit, do some readings about mindfulness in general uh, and, and how to use some of the structures of Satipatthana in our practice. So page 204, mindfulness is the key to a great opening. The common denominator between the factors of awakening and the four establishments of it and the four establishments, upatana, is mindfulness. The seven he's referring to the seven factors of awakening and the four satipatana, you know, which uh, translation he uses as establishments of mindfulness. Ajahn Jeff uses frames of reference. Commonly you see foundations of mindfulness. So the common denominator between these seven factors of awakening and the four establishments is mindfulness. These establishments represent where one directs mindfulness towards the body, feeling, mind or heart, and dhamma, with liberating results. Of these four, the body acts as the fundamental base for mindfulness. With a good grounding in the breathing body, 
we can manage to not react when meeting the evocative experience of feeling. That being the case, it becomes possible to remain open and steady in the face of the even more moving experience of the affective citta. As the citta, with its impulsive energies and compelling habits, is that which we identify, with which we identify, to maintain a coolly disengaged attention when meeting that is transformational. A skillful handling of citta's phenomena, dhamma, liberates. The fourth establishment of Dhamma is where mindfulness forms a path out of worldly currents. The contemplative trains to witness how obstructive Dhamma, such as hindrances, come into being and what causes them to persist or decline. Similarly, for supportive factors. This is the wisdom of know-how, the wisdom of path. It leads to the wisdom of realization that none of this is personal. With directly experienced realization, form, feeling, perception, activations, and consciousness, so the five khandhas, one of the uh, topics in the four Satipatthana, are seen as relative and changeable, and a reset occurs. For example, one can only witness one's embodiment as a changing process of sensations and energies for so long before orientation around its visual appearance wanes and is replaced by something healthier and more realistic. Wisdom, in terms of addressing and steadying bodily energies, will make illness, aging, and death less oppressive. In terms of perceptions, long-established attitudes about oneself and others when seen as changeable breezes that breezes that as changeable breezes that flutter in the heart tend to die down void of passion and belief memories and personal history can be accessed but they don't flood the, the citta all in all one's relationship to conditioned reality becomes dispassionate and filled with care and integrity and as far as the chicha's knowing aspect goes, that rests on an unconditioned basis. Given the predominant role that mindfulness plays in the path of liberation, mindfulness can be understood to be the aware state that co- accompanies all processes and steps in Anapanasati. This causes us to consider mindfulness to encompass all the skills needed to stay with and supervise the handling of a topic with the purpose of awakening. This is because right mindfulness is based on right view. We bear breathing in mind in line with that view of the potential for unskillful and skillful states. And within this frame of reference, hindrances get abandoned and the factors of awakening arise. So that's just a little bit of an introduction uh, with, I think, the emphasis being that you know, mindfulness is a much, um, uh, uh, you know, has a much broader meaning in the way that it's used in the Buddhist teachings uh, than in, in current popular, um, popular psych- psychology circles. Uh, and that um, it's always in context, right mindfulness is always in context with the other uh, path factors, uh, and uh, particularly the way it's often used with the Buddhist teachings is, is very much al- almost always r- in conjunction with uh, uh, sampajanya, clear, uh, clear awareness or uh, alertness, as Ajahn Jeff translates it. Um, and uh, so the right mindfulness remembers to see things uh, within uh, a context of of all of the other teachings, uh, virtue uh, and uh, development of the heart and, and the wisdom uh, to know that we can help uh, control uh, where we want to uh, put our attention uh, to do it in skillful ways that support the, um, the, the development of skillful states and the abandoning of unskillful states, right effort. Uh, 
So it weaves with all the other patterned uh, parts of the practice, mindfulness, right mindfulness. And uh, with that in mind, we'll talk a little bit more, more about the um, process of mindfulness and um, uh, particularly uh, a little bit of an introduction into the fourth Satipatthana.